Hi, I'm Emma Florio with Chicago Area Archivists, and this is season three of the Chicago Open Archives podcast, where we'll be exploring the archival origin stories of archives professionals from around the Chicagoland area. Today, I'm talking to Whit Sadusky, the archivist for the Gerber Hart Library and Archives, which focuses on LGBTQ history and culture in Chicago and the Midwest. Thanks for joining me today, Whit. Really happy to be here, Emma. Thank you for having me. And before we dive in to what led you into the profession, we're going to have a sort of an icebreaker question we're going to ask all of our season three guests. Fun. Which is, how do you explain what you do to people at family gatherings? You know, people may, might not know what an archivist does or what an archive even is. <laughs> yeah, that is a funny question. And it is difficult to describe. Um, sometimes I start um, explaining it and then just start laughing at myself. Really, what I what I say to, to family members is that um, so having a degree in history, I work on preserving that history, uh, the physical and digital aspects of it. So sometimes that's working with a box of donated materials, and sometimes that's working with uh, audio video um, materials. And basically, as the archivist, I'm working to preserve those materials and make them accessible for other people to look at, research, or just find. Uh, going off of that and then going back in time a bit. So what first got you interested in archives and how did you, how did you learn about the profession in the first place? And did you know going in that what, what you just described is what it was going to be? I feel like I had a, a bit of a grasp on when it was going to be my first foray into archives in general. I was uh, studying uh, for a BA in history at Boston University. And my senior year, I did a study abroad. I was lucky enough to do a study abroad program. The lead history professor had experience in archives, and so she was able to tell me a little bit about the profession in general. At that point, I hadn't decided on what I wanted to do with my history degree. You know, there's there's really only a handful um, of known ways that you can go once you get that degree. Do you want to go into higher academia or do you want to go into teaching? You know, those are the the two bigger paths, but you know, she sort of illuminated me to the idea of, well, do you want to, do you like the idea of museums and, or do you like the idea of preserving cultural history? And with that knowledge, I took that back to BU and there was an internship spring of my senior year working in the Howard Gottlieb Archival Research Center, um, was able to do some scope and contents and metadata for them. So really just sort of dipping my toes in what an archivist does and sort of just ran with it from there, um, decided that I didn't want to be a teacher and I did not want to <laughs> go into higher academia for history. So I uh, looked into different MLIS programs, knowing uh, that that was sort of the next step for me, um, getting that master's. So I found a program at Dominican University um, in Chicago and was accepted, deferred for a year. Um, did a couple random jobs and internships in the Midwest and then ended up making it there. Very good. And that sort of leads us into our next question to go over kind of your whole journey, your career path as an archivist, which is what the season is about. You've already kind of talked about your undergrad and grad school, but then after that, can you describe a little more maybe any internships you had or other you know, professional jobs that may or may not have been? related to archives, but you feel were, you know, part of your career path towards archives? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, my job list, my internship list is so long. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I've been lucky enough to work some really interesting contract positions. That's something that comes up a lot when you're trying to, to make it um, in this section of the industry. I said that I, I worked at internship in the Midwest before I ended up going to that master's program. And that was actually at the Missouri History Museum. Ended up doing that six months of work uh, for them, um, helping in their database, and just really starting to understand you know, what the process of working in archives was. From there, moved to Chicago, ended up applying for and, and getting the first archival internship job that I, I, uh, I looked into when I moved to the city. It was uh, with the Chicago Community Trust. Um, so it was a, a corporate archive, um, which is wildly different from the first uh, couple um, archival positions that I had at a 
place of higher institution and higher academia and then moving into you know museums and now I'm at a corporate archive so really I was just you know trying to figure out you know where where I wanted to go and what felt good to me worked that corporate archivist position throughout my time at my MLIS degree, and then got a bunch more internship positions post that. Um, worked for the Pritzker Military Museum, did some work at the Oak Park Public Library. Also was at that point um, a practicum student and then a volunteer for Gerber Hart. And that's where, you know, I still am right now. I was lucky enough to do such good work for them that they asked me to stay on um, as sort of the full, the full part-time archivist. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think my laundry list of, of, of internships and, and positions that I worked is really reminiscent of, I think, what a lot of people go through when they enter this profession is you need to work those short contract positions and maybe something opens up when you're there or maybe you have to move on to another one. There's, there's, um, you just have to get lucky really. Um, and I got lucky with Gerber Hart. So very thankful for that. Right. Definitely. I think you maybe sort of said this, though some of those internships were for school. Cause I know some programs require internships. So some were for school and some you kind of got on your own outside of or after school. Yeah, exactly. Um, So the uh, Chicago Community Trust was completely on me. That was a paid internship. Mm -hmm. Pritzker was also a paid internship that was outside of school. The Oak Park um, Public Library was, I think, 60 something hours of volunteer um, Mm -hmm. work uh, towards my program at Dominican. And then Gerber Hart was the, the like final practicum. I think that was like 120 hours or whatever that we have to do. So yeah, I had a couple for school, but then a a couple that were luckily enough paid um, that were great. Going back to uh, Gerber Hart, can you explain kind of what your current role is and what you you do there? Yeah, sure. So I I touched upon it when I I talked about, you know, what I would tell my family I do, right? So as the archivist, I'm sort of in charge of facilitating the processing and processing projects for new uh, donation arrivals, whether that's special collections or the personal archive collections, facilitating projects for interns, um, like I was myself at one time, Um, also establishing sort of standard practices for creating finding aids um, or making these collections more accessible. Um, So that's sort of where my area of expertise lies. So it's that physical processing, but also the finding aid digitization, which helps with accessibility. Those are my key points that I I try to get through. And had there been an archivist there before that you were you kind of took over for? Yeah, so Gerber Hart has has it's a very um, important history. Um, but the way that they'd gone about um, collecting and preserving their archival materials did not have any consistency to it, um, which is mm-hmm. why um, they were very thankful that I was able to come in and provide some of that consistency. Um, because prior to me, they did have Every once in a while, they had they had people come in, think like contractors that would come in and maybe do a larger project and then leave. They had an archivist, a, a standard archivist for a while, um, a few years before myself, um, that wasn't classically, classically trained um, mm-hmm. <laughs> in uh, archives um, or cultural institutions. So the standard practices weren't as, as uh, standardized. So when I came in, it was sort of um, a mishmash of uh, several people had sort of staked their claim or made their mark on the collections, um, but there was no sort of um, standard way of processing things or creating finding aids. So I came in and tried to sort of establish that. Was that exciting or daunting or both? (laughs) It was definitely both. Um, When you come into an institution like that, and I think we have uh, over close to, you know, 700 plus linear feet of materials. It's definitely daunting knowing that some of it is processed, some of it is processed poorly, some of it is yeah. not processed, <laughs> and having to sort of go back and fix fix things. But there was an excitement to sort of put my stamp on it, knowing that I was fresh out of school and I, I had worked. What I had done, actually, interestingly enough, was... I was um, somewhat inspired by the way that the Pritzker Military Museum 
produced and displayed their finding aids. I sort of took the inspiration from what I did for Gerber Hart for that. And yeah, I was excited to to feel like I was using my degree in a way that I wanted to and with a fantastic institution that aligned with my my values and um, my personal identity. Right. It's, it's great. I'm sure a lot of people can't say that even if they enjoy the archival work they're doing. Exactly. I feel very lucky to have been able to um, find Gerber Hart and, and establish sort of a connection there that's still going on to this day. Yeah. And then in addition to this work at Gerber Hart, you, you've got another full-time job that you, you, you had told me earlier sort of does sort of fit in with what you do there at, at Gerber Hart? Yes. So as much as I would love to be the full-time 40-hour-a-week archivist for Gerber Hart, we are only open for less than 20 hours a week. Um, and I only, um, when I was being paid for the position, was only getting paid for about six hours per week. Uh, so it mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily a sustainable um, business practice where I'd only have that as my job. But I was lucky enough to find uh, a position with a, a startup within here in Chicago um, called Hazel Technologies. Uh, they do some great work um, preventing food waste. And I could take my experience as an archivist and as someone who collects, sorts, and processes physical and digital data. And I took that to them and I was able to become their regulatory data coordinator, which is my day job and uh, enables me to have that uh, financial and mental security to be able to put into Gerber Hart, you know, on Wednesdays and Saturdays. So, mm-hmm. so could you uh, share a couple of maybe interesting projects that you've worked on, whether it's at Gerber Hart or previous positions, you know, that you enjoyed or that you're you're proud of? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a couple with Gerber Hart that I'm really, really excited to have been a part of. One. Um, which I'll talk about um, in length in a little bit, is called um, Unboxing Queer History, which is a podcast that we're doing at Gerber Hart. I'll actually talk about it in length right now. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> it was a great, great, wonderful idea and project that just fell in our lap. Um, Ari Mejia, who has done podcast work for several public institutions across the city, um, including Chicago Women's Health, brought this idea of a uh, podcast sort of highlighting what's in the boxes um, at uh, Gerber Hart. Because, you know, if anything, one of the things that we have struggled with in the past at Gerber Hart is um, to talk about the importance of the accessibility of our collections, but sort of broadcasting what we have. We're a fantastic institution. You said it in the beginning, we're one of the largest um, repositories of LGBTQ uh, memorabilia uh, in the Midwest. And we have so much um, from queer history that is not necessarily known to the community here in Chicago. So this opportunity that Ari brought, um, uh, in addition to co-producer Hannah Beattie, works for Slow Party, fantastic person, was the opportunity to sort of highlight these materials and in a way that is accessible and exciting for a wider swath of people to listen to and enjoy. And so fantastic project. I was included on a couple uh, recordings of the podcast, um, including highlighting the collection of a uh, Black trans activist from the 90s to early 2000s, Lorraine Chade Baskerville, who is a name that not many Chicagoans might know but should, hence the reason for this podcast. The work that Ari and Hannah and Jen Dentel and Aaron Bell, uh, uh, some more people that work with Gerber Hart, made this 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 beautiful, amazing production, and and every episode seems to get better. Um, so I was excited to be a part of that. Included on a few episodes, the Lorraine one I'm on, I'm on one I believe that talks about uh, Gals, um, which is the first collection that I. Um, process at uh, Gerber Hart for my practicum. Uh, GALS uh, is short for the Great Angling Lesbian Society, which I was fascinated and enthralled by when I saw that. And then one of the other podcast episodes I'm on highlights the other project that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, One of the exhibits that we did put up at Gerber Hart, uh, Q Activism at the Margins of Identity. 
so yeah, that being a part of this podcast and really speaks to the the values that I have as an individual, but also as an archivist, um, just wanting to bring the history that I know and love uh, to more people, um, especially when it comes to uh, queer history and queer community. I think that we need these stories um, more than most. So that's really exciting. So the other project that I, I touched upon just a moment ago was that uh, exhibit, uh, Q Activism at the Margins of Identity. We started that producing that exhibit um, in 2018, mm -hmm. sort of got the prompt for it, I believe that Christmas, right? And we were in sort of the final throes of production right when the pandemic hit. So the right. sort of opening had to get pushed back but even with those setbacks and the understandable chaos of producing, putting up, um, and promoting an exhibit during a global pandemic, what we made was, was pretty amazing. And, and we utilized a lot of uh, what we had in the collection, um, in addition to um, sort of going into the community and, and um, connecting with some queer elders that are still with us and uh, were able to contribute to the um, exhibit a sort of living history, right? Um, so that was really exciting. To be a part of that was fantastic. And I, as a, the archivist at Gerber Hart, brought my own certain level of um, knowledge of the collection. It made uh, pulling physical artifacts easier because I had a history in history academia, you know, writing uh, for the exhibit. I was also able to do, so that was a fantastic uh, project as well. So the the exhibit itself um, highlights uh, activism at the, in the 90s, which in and of itself was sort of this breakaway from the, the activism of the 80s, which was rooted in uh, AIDS activism, ACT UP, things like that. 90s, you sort of uh, fractured and uh, different groups in Chicago and across the United States sort of you saw advocacy sort of break away and, and people were really advocating for their own marginalized communities and identities. So that's where the, the name comes from. And yeah, it was a, a fantastic opportunity to just spread some knowledge about this history that, that doesn't get talked about. One, because it's so fresh, right? It's, it's, it was only about 30 years ago that it was uh, mm -hmm. really even being created. So there was a a difficulty as a researcher, as a librarian, to pull sort of uh, queer theory or, or um, secondary sources writing about this time because there hasn't been a whole lot of time to pass that has talked about the 90s and researchers do focus a lot on the 80s, rightfully so. So it's just an interesting uh, few hurdles that we had to go through, but even with those those hurdles truly worthwhile to to eventually put it up and also really lucky that it turned into sort of this fantastic example of living history you know we had we were able to uh, get donations from several individuals that were activists at the time Robert Castillo who was one of the he wouldn't say founding members but a really prominent member of the Chicago area queer nation, who the exhibit was loosely based upon. Um, he was able to donate, you know, pins and buttons from his collection. We got pride parade banners from him as well. Mm. Some fantastic um, primary source materials and flyers. And, and just being able to talk to him was a, was a wealth of knowledge, sort of contributing to this idea that living history is, is, is a completely different facet of of research and um, exhibition, things like that. We were also lucky enough to get um, some primary source materials, but also stories from um, some of the um, founders of HomoCore Chicago, which uh, in the 90s created this really radical, really open queer punk space, um, which was really community driven, um, really accepting uh, trans folks and just a great space. So being able to hear their, their stories as well really helped us sort of uh, describe what was going on during that time. So it was, it was that was, I was so lucky to be a part of that. Um, and really because I was the archivist, um, 
and knew the archive so well was one of the reasons that I was able to get on that project and really loved it. You know, almost questioned my <laughs> profession uh, should I have gone into museum <laughs> studies, but that's, that's a story for another day, right? The other, the other path for us, but you know, it's, it's right. just great to be able to, to work with Kerber Hart. Those, um, so unboxing for history and that Q exhibit really were fantastic opportunities for me. Also opened up the door to working on more exhibits. I'm, I'm working on one now, which I don't feel bad about saying the, the name of, because it'll probably be up by the time this goes up. Um, right. So it hasn't been published yet, but it's uh, going to be called Decoded, um, Surviving the Law as a Sexual Deviant, focusing on the decriminalization of sodomy in Illinois, one of the first, the first state to decriminalize sodomy, and sort of branching off from that, uh, that moment in history, looking at how acute uh, policing uh, targeted queer and trans people, specifically in Chicago. So super excited to show that um, as well. Um, and yeah, the work I do with Gerberhardt is, is fantastic. There's always something new every day. And in addition to all these really cool, like hard projects that I'm doing, just working with like the interns and volunteers that come in every day is so great because they come in and they're, they're fresh and they're excited to, to see what we have and, and showing them a process collection and then pulling out two or three linear feet of boxes that they have to go through. It's just, is great. It feels great to, to be sort of teaching people what I learned, how to process a collection, then seeing it come to fruition, seeing the finding it go up on the website. It's really fulfilling. You, you kind of touched on this a little bit right at the end of that, what, what you were saying is a, a question I had kind of well, as the archivist, obviously with a, a podcast or a, an exhibit, there's probably other people that kind of spearhead the project like how were you involved would you say with the initial idea maybe if at all or were you kind of there people were like oh wait wait we have an archivist over here <laughs> that can help out it was more the latter um because uh really uh, Ari who I mentioned who brought the idea to Gerber Hart um went through Jen Dentel whose name I also um mentioned she is the social media manager coordinator she wears a lot of hats so she was contacted first. And then, you know, at the time, there's only, you know, three paid positions at Gerber Hart. And of course, the archivist is going to be included on this really awesome new project. Um, and I was, yeah, lucky and happy to help and yeah. um, sort of helped a little bit with um, picking out sort of what would um, go with the different episodes. But yeah, most of the work was done by uh, Ari, Hannah, Ken, and and uh, also Aaron Bell, who does archival work for Gerber Hardy. And since we are doing a podcast right now and you are promoting this podcast, <laughs> would you say, you know, it's a good, would you, would you recommend it for archives and libraries, museums? Is it an easy thing to do? Would you say you should do this to promote your institution? I think that it's a fantastic way to promote what you have. And also... Mm -hmm. I keep using the word accessibility, but it's true. You know, not everybody can physically come into a space and see a um, exhibit, especially during a pandemic. And not everybody vibes with the idea of even reading long form media write-ups of, of things as well. So having the option to have an audio component can reach so many more people and it's accessible to younger people, people with shorter attention spans, people that just vibe better with an audio component to something yeah definitely I think that it is if not you know a key um to reaching a broader audience I think that it it, it could be very important going forward to sort of creating and having established this sort of idea that a podcast is something that you should be investing in and there's also some fantastic audio producers, artists, archivists, you know, I, I mentioned Ari and, and Hannah, they both met um, at an oral history workshop in New York City, but they are doing vastly different things. Like uh, Ari just got a new job. I cannot remember what it is, but Hannah is a full-time DJ pretty much. So there's just the fact that they were able to come together under the the umbrella of learning about oral histories and produce this podcast for us as a queer institution is fantastic and the connections that that they have 
also allow us to promote more widely. For example, um, Hannah um, was able to set up a listening party at the Soho House for this um, previous episode that um, I talked about the Lorraine Chade Baskerville one. And, you know, it was promoted on, on Soho House's Instagram. We were able to, you know, record some media for it. So just having this extra outlet of artistry, of uh, history, it just opens up so many opportunities to promote your institution that I feel like it's a no-brainer. We should try it if you have the funding um, or ability to sort of establish something like that. I feel like it's a great way to get stuff out there, a great piece of media. In addition to suggesting people do a podcast if they can, do you have other advice for people maybe whether they're just starting out in the profession or looking to do the kind of work you do or just for archivists in general. Yeah, I feel like we kind of got away from the heart of the discussion, which is like the profession of archiving and the importance of it. Mm -hmm. But I think that also speaks to just the diversity of the profession and like the things that you can do with a, a general MLIS degree. Um, the fact that I hold uh, a position with a, a startup as a data manager, but also work part-time as a queer archivist um, and do podcasting and stuff like that. I think the advice that I would give to people first starting out in the profession is uh, just be kind to yourself. You know, I talked about the all the different steps that I took to try and find a full-time position. And sometimes that, that non-linear path can feel really demoralizing um, I was lucky enough to have Gerber Hart throughout that whole time, you know, uh, sort of while I was working in Chicago, but not being able to find that sort of full-time archival position. It's hard, especially in a city like Chicago. It's a super competitive market. Um, and also, you know, notoriously having worked at several institutions, I didn't, I didn't say this before, but uh, while I was, you know, interning um, at Pritzker, I was also, you know, working several other jobs. I was uh, working as a an audience service staff at the Harris Theater. I was uh, uh, had a temporary position at um, the Jurassic World pop up at the Field that was here mm -hmm. like a few years ago. I worked at the gift shop. Mm -hmm. um, I also worked for several years at the Lincoln Park Zoo during doing uh, development and and fundraising for them. And. <laughs> It's, it's just, you have to be okay with your path being nonlinear and yes, being kind to yourself because there is a chance that you don't find that dream position right away. Mm -hmm. um, there's the chance that the position that you do find right away doesn't 100% align with your values, but there's a lot of opportunity in this city and also in the surrounding Midwestern area for, to find your niche. You know, whether that's working at Gerber Hart and starting a podcast or whether that's um, interning with the Pritzker and eventually getting hired full time like I was not. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's lots of different paths that we can take to find um, our place archiving or archiving adjacent. And yeah, just be patient with yourself. The other thing that I want to say is... Um, it can be hard to break into the profession, um, especially in Chicago. Um, I talked about all the, all the institutions that I worked at, not necessarily as an archivist, but there's so many wonderful institutions in the city with so many well-qualified, talented individuals that have the same degree as you, but they broke into the um, industry 10 years ago. And sometimes we notoriously jump between institutions. I've known people that worked at MSI and then they jump to the field and then they're at the shed and you know we just hop around a lot um, and that can be uh, really hard for for young people with you know Dominican um, is producing MLIS grads every semester so it, it can be right. very competitive to break in and I don't want to say this to scare anybody because I'm here existing as an, a very passionate, value-driven individual that was able to find my niche. Um, and even though there's those ups and downs professionally, you still have that sort of light at the end of the tunnel or the little things that get you by throughout the day 
that you got this degree with the hope of doing X, Y, Z, and, and someday you're, you're going to find it or something like it that is, is worth it for you. Be patient with yourself and be kind to yourself. Um, especially in Chicago, as an archivist, as a librarian, as someone with an MLIS, there's also a lot of competition. So just don't be mad when you don't get that first position out of your degree program that you apply to. That's the only thing that I would say. I wish that somebody had said that to me because I felt like I was being so hard on myself, applying to all these positions, only getting contract work. Why am I not getting my full-time position? It's because there's thousands of other people in a city with lots of institutions, but also lots of people looking so yes I can definitely vouch for all of that advice having worked many contract grant funded positions stringing them along oh god them together also (laughs) also Emma we know you have to learn how to write a grant just learn Ah, learn how to write a grant because you're going to be grant funding something you're going to either be grant funding a project (laughs) once you're employed or you're going to be grant funding yourself So just if you have the opportunity to sit down with someone that knows grant funding, or if you have the financial stability to take a class or something, just learn how to grant fund, throw it on your resume, and (laughs) it'll it'll open up some doors, definitely. All right. As we're sort of wrapping up, you've kind of touched on throughout our conversation why archives and the job of an archivist is important to you, but maybe if you want to kind of elaborate more on that as we wind down our conversation. Yeah, so I've sort of been spiraling around the idea that um, through archival work, specifically archival work uh, at cultural institutions, um, the stories that we preserve and make accessible are important. You may not see the importance of it right now or even in your lifetime, but I can guarantee that someone someday will find the things that you are preserving important. And especially from a lens coming from uh, someone that works primarily with uh, queer historical archives, these archives themselves, we most of them are from the 80s to the 2000s. That's when we got most of our donations for um, uh, very grim reasons of on it, of um, uh, people unfortunately passing away um, during the AIDS epidemic. But you know, the stories that the archives in Gerber Hart tell are oftentimes maybe not initially perceived as things that or stories that are important or stories that are big. You know, a lot of times you think of, you know, you need to preserve the Uh, the archives of presidents or celebrities or people that make generally significant um, marks on history. But a significant widely known mark is not necessarily the most important one. You know, some of the, the people that we have in our collection were just normal folks that, that, you know, gave us their collection, their notes, their laundry lists, their photographs with, you know, small handwritten notes on them. And, and the person that took them into Gerber Hart might not have seen uh, the importance of those things, but I can guarantee you when we go back into those archives now, even, you know, 25 years post these donations, we're finding gems of, of, of stories that uh, oftentimes need to be told, especially um, in queer community where we don't have a lot of um, elders to tell those stories, um, their archives lend those stories to us. So the important thing really is, as an archivist, is always making these collections shine brighter. You need to be the, the sort of lighthouse to lead people to these collections because they're stocked away in boxes and bankers' boxes do not look appealing most of the time. And, and you know, <laughs> People are not always going to pull out the John Hagenhofer collection at Gerber Hart Library and Archives, but um, if you write up the finding aid for the John Hagenhofer collection and someone sees, oh, wow, there's um, handwritten notes on photographs from the Columbia exhibition from a queer man in the 30s, um, 
they might go, yeah, I want to look at the John Hagenhofer collection. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. And then his story gets told and, and the knowledge that that stuff is in there, then it gets put in an exhibit in, at Gerber Hart in the future about, you know, snapshots of queer history. You take some photographs from the John Hagenhofer collection. So mm -hmm. the work that you do, you might not see the importance of it in the moment, but I promise you somebody will. And yeah, just... Uh, just keep going with it. And that's, that's really all I can say about that. That, that was all very, very good wit. Thank you for joining us and uh, sharing your archival journey and all the great work you're doing. And to our listeners, make sure to check out the um, Unboxing Queer History podcast. And we hope what you've said here today, Wit, is going to uh, inspire other archivists, you know, wherever they are on their own career paths. And be sure also to check out other episodes of the Chicago Open Archives podcast, but this season on YouTube, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, same for Unboxing Queer History, available on all your, your friendly neighborhood podcast platforms to hear stories of other archives professionals that we'll be talking to this season. Thanks again, Wit. Thanks for having me. Really excited. Make sure to visit me at Gerber Hart. I'm there on Wednesdays. <laughs>